Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of the Mead Podcast with Gosnells. My name's Tom, I'm the founder of Gosnells, and I'm joined here with my colleague Ted. How are you, Ted? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Good. You having a good week? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. It's been very, very busy recently. It certainly has. It certainly has. And I'm off, off travelling for a couple of weeks. So that is, that just adds to a nice little bit of free song to the environment, doesn't it? it so sure does. Good word there. Been doing the crossword this week. This week we are talking all about mead in the USA. And actually, the USA was where I first came across really good quality mead. So I was over in a place called Maine Mead Works in the Northeast. It was actually about 10 years ago now. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever had mead that was beautifully crafted. And it really kind of opened up my eyes to the whole world of what you could do with honey. So I'm really excited to be able to talk to loads of great mead makers on the show today and talk a bit more about what they're up to and why the industry is getting on so well. Um, we did a little bit of Googling about the industry in the US and it's going from strength to strength. So according to the 2017 report from the American Mead Makers Association, a new mead opened every three days in the US. So it's a really fast moving category um, and it's really exciting. It certainly is exciting. So this episode, we're going to be talking to an array of Americans about mead in the USA and learning a little bit about how it works out there. First up, I'll be talking to Vicky Rowe from Got Mead. Vicky has an extensive knowledge about mead in the States and she has been around during its month revival from the millennium. So let's find out more. How are you doing, Vicky? How's things? I'm doing pretty well. Things are going well. We're, uh, you know, going into the crazy season now of uh, getting ready for next year's Mead Con and, and competitions and all that. So would you like to explain in your best words exactly what Got Mead is? Well, Got Mead is, it's kind of my dream and my passion, but it was conceived as a way to keep track of information about mead, making mead, finding mead, buying mead, drinking mead, you know, pretty much everything mead. And, and so I kind of set it up as sort of a clearinghouse, um, a place to just keep all sorts of information, jumping off points to get to other information, which it's actually moving more towards the jumping off type now because there are so many mead resources out there now where when I started Got Mead, that was it. Got mead was all there was, so right. uh, yeah. So so I basically was like putting all the information on Got Mead. Now I'm actually in the process of um, retooling the website and and the the way it's put together so that I can make sure to you know to include all of these other resources to link out to them and let people know, hey, you know, this is one place, but look, here's all these other things that also have good meat information. So I'm going to make it I'm kind of going for trusted source of, you know, if it's here, if it's linked from here, I verify that this is good information. So that means that all those horrible YouTube videos that say boil your honey for three hours first um, are not going to be on there. You know? so. That's good to hear. Yeah, we're getting good information from Got Mead. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh... and so that's what I kind of I kind of want to create that that, you know, resource of knowing that if, if you see it here, at least, you know, if I'm linking it, that then then I guarantee that, that there's good information to be had. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And uh, Vicky, how did you get into Mead? What kind of started off your dream and, uh, and the company in itself? I kind of fell into it, actually. I, I've always been interested in home winemaking. My dad made wine in the basement with balloons on the bottlenecks and everything when I was a kid. I remember one, one year he decided he wanted to make dandelion wine. My brother and I had to pick every dandelion in like a four acre yard. And it's like to this day we still gripe about that to my father, and that was fifty years ago. Yeah. yeah. And and um, and um, you know, so I always found it interesting the whole you know the the whole magic of fermentation, and and after I got older and went off to to uni and everything, it you know it kind of took a back seat. But I grew up being a huge fan of fantasy and science fiction books. So, you know, fantasy books there very often there was mead. And um, so it was kind of always in the back of my head. And so when we went to university, um, you know, we made a lot of friends there. And after we got out, one of our friends was making mead in his basement. And it was terrible mead. But it got you drunk, you know. So. <laughs> they tend to be. They tend to be. Yeah, right. And at that <laughs> age, it's like, mead. can I get drunk is the question. Not does it taste good, but will it get me drunk is the question when you're, you know, uh, at that age, I guess. <laughs> but um it, uh, you know, it got me thinking about it again. And then shortly thereafter, we went and we were living in Michigan at the time. We went to the Michigan Renaissance Festival and at the Ren Fair, they had a mead and it was uh, Chaucer's Mead, which is made by Bargetto Winery in California. And at the time, it was very, very sweet, you know, like almost cloying. 
and um, they came with a uh, a small bag of herbs. You can't. I'm using my hands to show that you can't see it. <laughs> there was a small bag of herbs that was hung around the neck that you were supposed to heat the meat, drop the bag of herbs in, and then you got instant spiced meat. And um, they sold this for about ten dollars U.S. a bottle, a seven, uh, you know, seven fifty milliliter bottle. So the Ren Faire was selling those. We like two ounce cups, like the ones the dentist used to give you to with water to spit with, and 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 they were selling those two ounce cups for four dollars. So, so they were getting about fifty dollars U.S. for every bottle of Chaucer's that they were pouring. And I thought, because I'd seen this stuff in the stores, and I thought, well, that's just ridiculous and highway robbery to boot. So I can do this, but how? And at the time, this was, of course, this was back in the 80s. There was no internet. There was, you know, there wasn't any place like that. So my, but my father-in-law had uh, CompuServe. Um, <laughs> probably not. That. Yeah. The, yeah. It was. It was a. It was a resource. It was before. It was like pre-internet. Internet. There was. Sure. It was all. It was all typing. There was no visuals at all. There was no graphics or anything. You just typed in your um, request of what information you were looking for, and it would go out and search like government databases and. Um, um, lists of books that were kept by libraries and stuff like that. Oh, and wow. yeah, and it was horribly expensive, but my father-in-law, who was a doctor, had a, had a connection to it. And so I used that to start getting some information and started taking notes. And I using that, I found um, Acton and Duncan. I found, um, which, you know, was printed back in the 50s. I found, um, you know, the old meat books. There was only like two. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I found those and I went and I basically went and ordered them at a bookstore, you know, to have them sent because they didn't carry them in a bookstore. They were not popular books. So, you know, it wouldn't take up space there. And so I got that. And then shortly, not long after that, we started getting like the beginnings of the Internet. So um, I used a very small space that was given me by my email provider uh, to start practicing HTML. And so I started writing out my notes online and using HTML to create it. And, and so as, as the internet started to kind of connect and people, other people started getting on it, suddenly people were emailing me going, Oh, I found this little page you made and that's great information you have about me. Tell me more. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amazing. And, and so I didn't start out to start got me, got me kind of got me. <laughs> and, and yeah, and so when people started asking, I'm like, oh, there's an interest here. All right, what else can I find out? And and I learned, you know, and as 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 things started to happen, Yahoo happened, and then we had some resources and a little bit more connectivity, and eventually Google happened. But um, I just kept building it, and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now it's like 200 plus pages, plus the largest forum on me, pretty much anywhere. And, um, you know, now we've got the radio show, we've got uh, Facebook groups, um, you know, and of course, social media accounts everywhere. So it's, yeah, it's, it, it's become this ginormous, ever expanding octopus with tentacles everywhere. <laughs> uh, talking, about, talking about Facebook pages, we came across your Got Mead Facebook page, and uh, we uh -huh. posted post about the podcast there. And it was actually, I think, the most popular post we've done about the podcast on anywhere on social media. So that's what it's for is to be about me. You know, I mean, God means just about me for everybody. Exactly. Exactly. So why was it that you chose mead over sort of beer and cider and wine? Or I, you say you sort of, sort of fell into it. Did you did you have a sort of passion for mead before you before you fell into it? Well, I've always I've always been, like I say, into into, uh, you know, fantasy books. So I was reading, you know, a lot of those kind of uh, swords and sorcery kind of things and magic and all that sort of stuff. There was always mead. So it had that kind of romantic thing for me and then after i got out of university i started developing and, and and prior to this i had no interest whatsoever in history it was like boring stuff didn't really want to, but after i got out i i ended up meeting people who were into historical interpretation who did living history uh I went to the renaissance festival and so i developed this this love of history and started doing research about coming across me and i thought wow this is really amazing and and it just it brought back that kind of interest that I had had peripherally through the books that I was reading, and then I thought, wow, I, I really want to do this. And and I got more and more. It just basically kind of it, it basically kind of lit my you know lit up and and took over. <laughs> Amazing. 
That's yeah. pretty cool. That's really cool. I mean, very similar to kind of how, how we did it here, I think, <laughs> at least with Tom and all that kind of stuff. Well, it was, um, sure it was a, the funny thing is, is what really ignited it was England. Elizabethan, Elizabethan England. And, you know, when it was so funny, when I went to Great Britain in 2002, I was shocked at how little mead there was. <laughs> saying, saying that, I think Tom got the idea from America. So the complete opposite with you and Tom. So that's, oh, that's interesting. That's so funny. <laughs> he, he was off at uh, Maiden Mead Works. And, uh, yeah, he discovered Great Mead there. And uh, that's sort of uh-huh. what drove his, his passion for it. So, yeah, yeah. amazing. So I was going to ask, how how's the industry changed over the past decade? I'm sure you know quite a lot about um, sort of how it's formed and changed over the years. It's changed a lot. I, when I got started with uh, Got Mead, there was just the one meadery, and that was Chaucer's Bargetto, which is a large California winery. So we're not talking, you know, like little, I mean, they are family owned, but it's a huge company. And, and the mead thing was just like one tiny little part of their business. But... Um, Shortly after that happened, we had a um, we had a uh, news group going back when there wasn't any there wasn't any Facebook or anything like that. So we had email lists. Everybody was on the email list and just sent out a digest of what everybody said once a week. And it was called the Mead Lovers Digest. And um, which actually the entire all of the Mead Lovers Digest are available on Got Mead if anybody cares to go back and kind of look at the genesis of the mead world uh, in, in America. It's an it's an interesting read. But um at any rate, though, uh, that was where we kind of all got started talking about it. And Mike Fall, who owns Rabbit's Foot Meadery, one of the older meaderies in the United States, was on that group. And he he got things, you know, going in his, his part of the world. And um, he's in California. And there was, in the early 90s, there was 10, maybe 15 professional meaderies out there. And uh, pretty much the rest of it was a desert. And you couldn't get it if you didn't live nearby. You just couldn't get it. So, you know, it wasn't like you could purchase it in shops in other parts of the country or online or anything like that. And it slowly grew through the 90s. It was when it was when we entered the new century, you know, the 2000s, that things really took off. And it it looks like and, and I haven't been able to prove this, but just based on my observations and and what I know about the industry, Basically, when um, the Gen Xers and the Millennials came of age, you know, they kind of kicked off this huge burst of energy and growth. It's really, really fascinating. It's interesting to hear that the, it's sort of almost the younger generation that brought it back. So what is the most exciting thing about mead in the USA? Um, I think the, the the I want to say the newness of it, but mead's the oldest thing there is. So it, it's it's the fact that it's so exciting. It's it's not beer, it's not wine, it's not cider. All of these things have always been around and people are aware of them. But mead is people look at it and they go, Wow, I don't even know what this is. And uh, or they come to it and go, oh, honey equals sweet. So yuck. And and yeah, so and, and the so excitement. True. Yeah. And the excitement when they find out that not only does mead not necessarily have to be cloyingly sweet uh, and we hope that it never is cloyingly sweet. You know, I mean, sweet is fine. Cloying is bad. But, um, you know, is that they find out that the variety and the breadth of what mead is gets them so excited. I mean, I've never seen such energy. You don't see this kind of energy in the wine world. People are like, yeah, okay, I like Merlots, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's very true. I think people are yeah. realizing the sort of like terroir aspect of, uh, of mead and kind of that originality where the honey's coming from. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that's, that's really exciting for people and also quite a new concept almost. So, it, yeah, it's, it is, it's really great. Yeah. Well, it's new and it's also currently illegal in the United States. We we are not allowed to to say um, this is meadow foam honey from the Pacific Northwest on the labels um, because the government does not yet. We're hoping this will change, and I'm sure it will. But you know, it takes you know how governments are. It takes time. We're hoping that they'll eventually allow us to really let the varietal shine. I mean, we're, there's a lot of varietal meads being made in the United States, but you can't say on the label what it is. They 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 knock that down. So That's um, yeah, it's something that that you know is on our radar of something we'd like to see happen. But our our first thing is to get mead recognized as mead. We're actually considered wine other than standard wine. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean see in the UK we we call it a mead, but Again, there's not really any sort of legal definition of mead at the moment, which is what we're trying to kind of 
slowly ease into you know the drinks world and you know give me its proper definition you know how much yeah. honey is in it all this kind of stuff had, had that conversation with lime bay just the other day as a matter of fact yeah i think we had a very similar conversation with them as well um uh, over the podcast so yeah it's it's a difficult industry really isn't it to to sort of it get is. those in and things like that but we're trying we're trying all we can we're we're what uh, I've always I've always said that we're the redheaded stepchild of the alcohol world, um, you know that 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 oddball relative that everybody goes yeah well you know they're just weird, yeah. <laughs> okay. we, we don't want that we don't want that stereotype anymore. Anyway. Right, right yeah you know it's like yeah well you know how he is <laughs> it's like that uncle that everybody just says oh god you know so but you know, I mean to a certain extent that's us we're the new kids on the block. And we're the redheaded stepchildren that, um, you know, and you know, gingers have no souls, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah. so what kind of person, what kind of person is drinking mead in the U.S. at the moment? What's the sort of demographic? Honestly, I'd say the largest demographic right now is those same Gen Xers and millennials. It's the, you know, it's the 20, it's the 20 something to 40 something crowd that are, are the biggest uh, adopters of mead right now um i mean there's there's a lot of people from every walk of life but it does seem to be more that um more guys than women are making it but i think more women than men are drinking it we're trying to we're trying to push that you know that aspect of it on the making side trying to get more female involvement in that and and part of that is just that well and, and this is so weird because it's, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a man's world to a certain extent yeah we try and get our drinks to obviously a bit of a bit of both men and women and yeah. uh, we're, we're seeing popularity amongst both at the moment which is which is incredible yeah i mean the, the tap room you, you have lots of women coming down and they absolutely love it they think it's really nice because it's sweet and then you have men coming down who enjoy our you know for example our hops range um, mm -hmm. because they're slightly more beer orientated and a little bit less sweet. And we're, we're trying to accommodate for everyone at the moment. So yeah, it's good. I think there's a lot of possibility in mead sort of just appealing to everyone, which is why it's such a great drink. It really is. Yeah. And the, I, I love the, I love the variety of it. It's, uh, you know, it can be, it can be, in, uh, it can be as sweet as, you know, your first kiss or as dry as the driest desert and so many different ingredients. I mean, fruits and vegetables and spices and, and hops and, oh my God, peppers. And, you know, I mean, so many things that you can do with it. There's literally endless combinations. So true. So true. So what do you, what do you see happening in the next sort of five to 10 years? Do you reckon any of the, any of the big players will start to enter the fray? You know, the Heineken and, you know, all these kind of guys, do you reckon they're going to start making meads and it's all going to become a bit saturated? Uh, yeah, I think, I think we're only maybe a year possibly to to uh, away from one of the big players probably trying to buy mm. a meadery and uh, kind of like what AB InBev has been doing with craft breweries. So I think, in fact, I think it's already happening on the QT. It's not actually, they've not actually done it, but they're making inquiries. So uh, it, it is going to happen. It is inevitable. Um, I don't know. You probably didn't see it over there, but AB InBev, uh, you know, the Budweiser people, uh, had released a beverage they call the B beverage, the letter B, not B E E, and uh, it's basically like a 2.5% honey flavored seltzer kind of thing. And they're not calling it a mead, but you can see that they're kind of putting feelers out to see what the reaction is. They were real quiet about it. It was really interesting. We all caught on to it, and we're like, uh-huh. They probably say it's just as bad as Budweiser, but you know. Uh <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon it's got any honey in it? Yes, it actually supposedly does have honey in it, or so I'm told. So hard to say. But, um, yeah, I think we're going to see the big players getting involved, and I think it'll start with them buying one or more meteries. So they'll, it'll be interesting to see who it is and what they do with it. The, there's the big part of me that says, God help us, I hope they never do that, because, yeah, like you say, to keep it true, and those guys are the devil, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like they are the bane of existence for those of us that make actual real beverages that taste good. Um, but um, at the same time, if a big boy were to own or create an actual real and tasty mead, um, they have a lot more swing at the federal level than the rest of us little guys. So it's kind of a there's a it's it's hard to say what's good or bad about that because 
a lot of it's going to depend on what they do with it. Thanks, Vicky. Amazing to chat. And thanks for giving us such an in-depth view on mead in the States. Next up, we're talking to Jeff Herbert from Superstition Media again. So thanks a lot for joining us, Jeff. Um, can you just start by maybe talking us through the sort of styles you're producing and what the balance is between ABVs and flavors? I would say that the vast majority of what we do would be semi-sweet on the mead scale and 13 or 14 percent ABV. Yeah. And probably it's going to have fruit of some kind or some kind of cool, uh, in, you know, adjunct like a vanilla or cacao. It's just talking about like our average sort of thing that we do. Um, but I, but we do session meads, and we haven't done many. We actually just um, started a program this year. So I did a SWOT analysis with with our crew, um, our, say all of our sales and production folks last November. And we spent four hours just detailing all of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, that we see um, with, uh, you know, our business, the meat industry, the, you know, the market, the trends, what's going on. And a lot of the suggestions that we all agreed on was that at Superstition, we need to figure out how to do some really delicious session meads and ciders and some other products where the, you know, the cost going in on the front end is going to allow us to have um, a lower price point and some different options in the market. Because, you know, for the most part, we've done just ultra premium stuff that, yeah. it, you know, it's been really, really great. And I love those meads. And, you know, those are the things that the, you know, I think craft beverage fans get real excited about and you get high ratings, but at the same time, you know, it's not something people are going to drink every day. And it's important to, you know, to grow the meat industry in, in other ways. And that means getting our products in the hands of folks who, you know, might not want to spend 30 or $40 for a bottle of something. And so we've just developed some really exciting stuff. And I think some are going to stick. And so we did, you know, as you know, your listeners probably know, which is kind of funny to say, but session meets for, you know, the parlance of of our, <laughs> yeah. of our uses, like 10%, right? So for yeah. a beer drinker, that sounds ridiculous. But, you know, and there are reasons for that as far as, you know, I think when you look at a traditional mead, a lot of times um, when you get closer to 10%, you know, you just get more flavor, right? And it depends on the style, yeah. of course, the sweetness and all. But um, I think that our, like our guava session mead was 10% carbonate it. We put it in this really cool 500 milliliter, like black bottle and people nice. are digging that. And yeah. then we did a couple other, uh, just crazy flavor ones. And so we're seeing what people like. And then I do want to, um, produce, which we've done some test batches and thrown this stuff on tap in our tasting room, but I do want to develop some, uh, some meads that are, you know, 6% or so. And yeah. right now we're playing around with that. And there's a reason for it as far as regulations go in America. And so every country and even state and city sometimes have their own just ridiculous alcohol laws. And, yeah. you know, you, you can spend all your time fighting them or you can play by the rules and just make, you know, make your business work. So anyways, one of the things we, we have in America that's kind of funny, there's this loophole where um, anything that has, you know, 0.5, half a percent of alcohol is all of a sudden considered an alcoholic beverage. It has right. to have a yeah. government warning label. Well, in between 0.5% and up to 7 there's no entity that approves labels in America oh, yeah. for alcohol. And so when you see, um, you know, ciders and, and meads and, and even wines and, you know, now cans that are under 7%, there, you can, you can kind of say what you want on that can in, in a way that you might not be able to talk about the mead specifically or the honey you used. And there are still rules you have to follow. But, you know, you can you have a little bit more leeway. And but the really great aspect of that is it just saves you time. And so when you've got an idea for a product, if you're fermenting everything together and, you know, now if you're going to put in hops, say that they consider that a flavor, you'd still need a formula approved. But if you're right. fermenting just fruit juice and honey, then, you know, you and it's under 7 percent, you're saving all of this time with your formula and label approval. Cool. Yeah. And you can just do something that's awesome and, and bring it to bring that product to market faster. So there's, there's, you know, really cool reasons to do that. So I think that that'll be important for us, um, moving forward. So yeah, we've got some stuff in the hopper there as far as other session meets that are, you know, getting closer to what, you know, a regular beer drinker would, would be expecting an ABV. That's pretty cool. So you've obviously got like a, a great international rep rep reputation and you're, you're really well known, but where does most of the product go? Is it mostly within state or, you know, in the US? Like I mean, where, where are you focused sales wise? Yeah, that's a really good question. So first, the answer is most of our sales are in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, at this point, our tasting room is doing um, 
do, doing amazing, in, especially for being in a small town. But we're actually we're moving more products through distribution in Arizona in almost 200 accounts. But it took a while to do that. It took a couple of years to have our, our Arizona sales uh, exceed what we were doing in our tasting room. And two years ago, we, we first started sending products out of state. And we actually sent stuff outside the country for some festivals maybe five years ago. So we were doing very limited international distribution before we even left Arizona, which is kind of funny. That's backwards cool, yeah. for a lot of folks. But, but I want to talk about for a second the reason behind that, because that's a really good question. And as you know, um, our greatest challenge, I think, and I'd like to know if you agree with me, is that, first of all, it's expensive to make, and so it's an expensive product. And the other thing is, you know, no one knows what it is. I mean, unless you're, if you're listening to this, this program, yeah, you know hopefully. what it is. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no kidding. And, and, hey, if you don't, you're going to learn a lot. So that's <laughs> yeah. great. But so, so those are huge challenges for, for a business. But we turn that into our, our greatest asset, and I think it's that we get to define need. And, you know, Superstition and Gosnells yeah. and some of our other friends in the industry at this really exciting time, we are defining what this beverage is and can be to so many people, the thousands of people all the time. And so that's, that's, that's the thing you have to do. And by defining it, I'm talking about education. So when you walk down the aisle in a, in a bottle shop, a liquor store, you're looking at a menu even, if, if you don't know what meat is, it's going to be challenging to, you know, commit to something that's brand new and that's maybe expensive to a lot of folks. You know, the adventure uh, of the craft beer drinker, I think, is something that's great for us. And, and lots of craft beer, you know, folks are into trying every, the next new thing and the next crazy flavor, which is so awesome for them uh, getting into mead. But you know, it takes education. And so our tasting room is just killing it because when you come downstairs to our underground, you know, cellar space, we renovate it. I mean, besides the fact that everything's built with these noble materials of, you know, wood and glass and steel, yeah. it's just authentic, right? Authenticity is really important to our brand. Our staff is very well trained and, uh, you know, unless it's a Saturday night that's just nonstop, you're going to be able to have a conversation about our company and the history of mead and the styles. And now our menu's broken down into, you know, Melamels, Piment, Sizers, we're using the terminology that mead makers use and we're not, a, you know, we're not shy about it. You know, we used, when we first opened up, we even told everyone we have a wine tasting room just so they had a point of reference. And now it's, it's a meadery and we have all these styles of mead and you get a huge education. And so that's really exciting. And that's what our sales reps are doing out there as well. And we do, uh, we pay our sales reps to do tasting events four to six times a week, somewhere around the state. And we're, we're launching in different states and doing events. Uh, we've got staff right now in Finland uh, pouring at a craft beer fest, and nice. we just launched our brand there. So that's super exciting. Um, we even, um, you know, we're, yeah, we're growing as fast as we can. Um, you know, it's it still really feels organic, though, because of all of that education, I think, that's required to sell meat. Thanks very much, Jeff. Really great to hear how quickly Superstition is growing out in the States. Next up, we're talking to Matt Kwan from Always Meadery, based in New York. So in terms of, I mean, obviously the mead industry in the States is is growing and uh, I guess drinkers' perceptions of mead are, are really changing. You're, I mean, you're based pretty much in a similar part of the world to where we are in London, if you know there's a, a bit of a correlation there. Um, what kind of drinkers do you get drinking your mead and what are their, do they have preconceptions about mead before they come in or are they oh. relatively new to the category or? Okay, yeah, so great question. Um, so like you were saying, you know, I, I, I always, I've never been to London specifically, but everyone always tells me, and I got some buddies that live out there that they, they always say that, um, London is just basically New York, um, just a little bit more rainy <laughs> and a lot greener. I'd like, I'd yeah. like, like to add as well. That is know. very true. Yes. Yes. Um, but so the, the, I, I suppose the drinking demographic is similar, although you guys are really big into gin over there, which I myself am, am a huge gin fan. Uh, but but with the, the drinkers that do come into the meadery, um, I'd say like 85% of them ha have no conception of what meat is and, and they're walking in and, and, and they're like, hey, never tried this before, really interested in the alcohol um, that you guys are making, please tell me about it. Um, and I would say 90% of those people come in thinking that it, it's going to be a sweet drink. Um, and, and, you know, I always, I always counter the argument with um, grapes are, are inherently very sweet uh, same as honey um, you can have dry dry wines ju just like we're doing the dry meats that we're doing at all wise um, and and that's the majority of them uh, and I, I'd say 
probably the most people that come through and and that are i guess most open to the actual drink are, are going to be um craft beer drinkers they they always come in and and they're like you know i've been drinking craft beer for x amount of time you know in my life and mead is kind of a i don't know about over in in the uk but mead over here specifically is actually really really blowing up yeah um and it's you know we're kind of trying to ride that trend and uh really push the the category as a whole um of course with with us at the top <laughs> <laughs> um here in the u.s but uh but you know we we enjoy the uh the craft brewers that come in and that and you know they they all really enjoy our products um and, and i think it's just you know it's we're doing the dry style and, and i think that that kind of leans into the uh, broader demographic versus the the super sweet means that a lot of the meteries are producing right now but um you can kind of see a shift uh, over the past i would say like six seven months uh, I, I guess like when 2019 kind of turned over and that a lot of the meteries out here we're starting to kind of shift their focus onto not necessarily completely dry, but sort of the semi-dry, semi-sweet, whichever way you want to call it, um, yeah. um, category of mead, and uh, kind of what similar to what you guys are doing um, with the, with the session style draft meads. Uh, a lot of a lot of bigger corporations have actually started to jump on the trend. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Budweiser's Dilly Dilly. Uh, I am. Commercial. I am. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, so, I am, yeah. So it, it was crazy. And, you know, it's kind of like a, I always talk about this with, with Dylan. Um, it was it was kind of like a genius marketing scheme on Budweiser's end because they had this, like, 18-month lead-up of this Dilly Dilly commercial, and they kind of tied it into Game of Thrones at the very end for the, for the ending of Game of Thrones. But... Um, they had their subsidiary actually uh, the day after that that uh, commercial campaign ended. Their one of their main subsidiaries came out with their own session style mead. Yeah, and it kind of, of is that yeah. That's just in like Boston in the Northeast, right? It's, yeah, it's in the yeah. it's in the Northeast, and and you know it was it's kind of like a genius marketing scheme on their part, and that they're going to pour so much money into making fun of mead as a, as a category. Um, and get it into people's minds and kind of on their radar and then turn around the next day and be like, oh, by the way, here's our subsidiary that is making a session style draft mead, three and a half percent. And I think they got like two or three um, different flavors or varietals. I don't know how, how they're, they're, their marketing is kind of weird and in, in how they're pushing it. But um, they're, I don't, you know, they're, they're trying to get that, that category into, uh, onto the radar and, you know, they're massive evil corporations. Yeah, they've got a scale. Say. They've got a scale that they can they can yeah, just they, turn on marketing that they yeah. can do anything. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Matt. Really great to hear from you again. Next, we're back with Jeff and Terry from Liquid Alchemy Beverages. Thanks a lot for joining us, Jeff. Where exactly are you selling all of your stuff at the moment? Yeah, right now, uh, and it's interesting you asked that because um, you know when when people are in their their early stages of of some kind of business. Um, you know, you, you're, you're just treading water. You want to get your name out there. You want to get your products uh, into people's hands, but, but you really can't afford to go with any kind of a uh, structured distribution because all these people take, you know, a, a bit of your money. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, uh, in the beginning it was tricky in the last, you know, the first two years that we were open, we pretty much did everything ourselves. So Tara and I <laughs> went to, you know, we, we, we make this stuff. We, we, uh, uh, work our tasting room and we'd go out to restaurants and talk to people and do tastings and, and try to get our things on people's shelves and, and on taps. Um, and little by little it's, it's, it's worked. And we finally got up to the point about a month ago where we joined with one of the largest distributors in Delaware. Oh, congratulations. Uh, that, thank you. And they do all the big craft beer. So we're their, you know, kind of other craft. Um, and, uh, we did a tasting with them uh, they, they kind of fell in love with the two. And, uh, so they took us on. And ever since that, geez, in the last month, we probably got another five, six, seven accounts and we're Amazing. growing well. We're expecting by the end of the year, um, to be in maybe somewhere between 15 and hundred different places. Um, so right now I, I think we're around the 35, 40 range, yeah. um, in a combination of restaurants and stores. Um, but it's doing really well. It's being well received. We love the comments. Uh, we get people that are coming in on a regular basis that say, oh, I tried you at, you know, blah, blah, blah pub. 
and it was awesome. So I thought I'd come to see you or I, I saw you at this restaurant or, or I got it at this liquor store. And uh, it's been pretty neat seeing that happen. Thank you very much, Jeff. Great to hear you've joined one of the largest distributors in Delaware. Finally, we're joined by James from Charm City. When I look at the US market, it feels much more developed than the UK market. We're, we're pretty... Um we're pretty small and, and there's, there's not much consumer awareness here. Have you seen like a lot of, have you seen, obviously me has been growing in the States. How have you seen that happen? And what, what's been the change in people's perceptions? I would say that the grass is always greener on the other <laughs> side. And well, this uh, is the story I tell my investors is that, you know, it's all happening in the States. So it's bound to happen. Right. here. <laughs> well, the impression, I think, of the industry, you know, if you're looking at it through insider publications and sources like, you know, some of the Facebook groups and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's very uh, there's it seems like there's a lot going on, but compared to beer and compared to cider, even though we're the fastest growing portion of the alcohol segment here yeah um there's a lot of growth and a lot of knowledge um or education still to be done i would say that your common like everyday mead drinker is uh they exist now which is awesome yeah um, you know, fairly large quantities by our standards, but by in comparison to beer or cider, um, it's a, it's a different thing. And something that I've kind of noticed about our own business, which is very interesting, is that you know, in in it's interesting because it parallels a lot of other mead here. In that, all right, we started very small, yeah, and we priced our products for what we thought was a volume play back when we started, but that at that scale, it was uh, hard for us to turn much of a profit. And at the same time, we were also um, reaching out to our, towards a much larger market and um, lower than a lot of the other mead in, in the market. And yeah. as we've grown our efficiencies, have have really grown in terms of our production facility and that kind of thing, um, and we're at a point now where we need to really drive volume, which means a lower price point. Yeah. So I would rather sell a thousand units and make ten cents off those units than a uh, hundred units and make twenty. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it, it yeah. just uh, we really need to um, do that. And I think that um, as more people are picking it up, the the cost is coming down. Uh, so the retail price point is getting more competitive with sure. beer and cider. And I think you really need that to have people just pick it up and try it. Thanks a lot, James. That was really interesting. Ted, did you enjoy that? What, what did you kind of take away from it this week? Yeah, it was really good. It's really interesting to hear that people have uh, started off much like they would in the craft beer industry, um, but instead with meads. And great to hear that mead is taking off in the States, especially for us in London. Yeah, it's really interesting. That's what I took away as well, is that drinkers started off drinking craft beers and are kind of exploring outside of that into mead. It definitely bodes well for us in the UK, because obviously what, what happens in America happens here, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, next week we are talking about mead what is it good for and the answer is everything so we're talking about mead cocktails and cooking and all the amazing things you can do with mead so join us again next week see you later catch you then bye bye